Good morning. Very nice to see you all again. Now we're going to do something extremely fun. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I think I'm having what the Germans call a schadengasm. What do they teach you to talk like this in some Panama City sailor want a hump hump bar? Or is this getaway day and your last shot at his whiskey? Sound crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. I, I believe it or not, I watch my words very carefully. There are those that think I'm a very stable genius, okay? Hey everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining me again today and Debbie here in the studio as we talk about noses. I'm going to con continue the series on facial anatomy. A couple weeks ago we did the eyes. If you haven't seen that one, go back and check it out. We're going to move our way through the face so we all understand how to properly draw the structure and anatomy of the facial features, whether you're doing portraits or caricatures. Uh, but especially if you're doing caricatures and want to do them realistically, it's really, really helpful to know the underlying anatomy, uh, especially of the nose, because there's a, there's some interesting stuff going on that's not always visible on the surface. But when it is visible on the surface, those structures can look kind of odd or unusual. And if you try to caricature them in a way that you don't understand what is going on, you might do it in a way that just breaks the reality of the face. So I'm a caricature artist that likes to do fairly realistic, anatomically correct caricatures. Um, so I think it's really helpful uh, to know these kinds of things. Uh, I want to say hello to folks in the chat. We got uh, Jim and Sargon. Hello, Dorian, Carlton. Uh, and someone called which brush do you use? We got a joker in the group. Don't know who that is, but pretty funny. I do love puns. And those are puns I pretty much all made throughout the times I taught the nose in, in live classes at the Watts Atelier, yeah. But uh, if you can think of any more, uh, welcome. You know, just feel free to drop in with any more um, nose puns. Uh, hello, Fabio and Kasem and hey, Patrick. Good to see you. And Shiny's here. Uh, so, oh, I think this is covering up my face a little bit. Let's move that. Sorry. Chat window is covering up my face, and I don't want that. Because, you know, you can look at my nose and see an anatomy if you want. So uh, Debbie's joining us. Say hello, Debbie. Hello. Hey, so uh, if you have any questions, of course, type them in the chat and Debbie will bring them to my attention. Uh, 
and hopefully add some colorful commentary as well. So um, the nose. A lot of people, I think the biggest mistake people make when drawing the nose is not getting the perspective correct when the nose is turned slightly. Uh, and if you just think of the nose basically as a four-sided pyramid with a top plane, these, the top plane here is one, the two side planes and the bottom plane, and the base of the pyramid being, you know, the, where it connects to the face, that can help out a lot. So whenever you are drawing the nose, I start with just those simple basic shapes, just outline the ridges of the pyramid. And sometimes the bottom plane will come straight out, sometimes it'll be upturned, sometimes it'll be downturned, but the nose essentially has just those four basic planes. And also it's a lot more angular than people realize. In most lighting situations, the nose does look pretty rounded. And on a lot of people, it, the ball of the nose especially is very rounded. But if, as soon as you get it into some direct lighting, like a spotlight or something from the side or above, you can actually see a pretty sharp division between the planes, from the top plane to the bottom plane. Uh, so don't fall into the trap of overly uh, smoothing out and rounding out the nose. And there are some rare people, not rare, but a good percentage of the population where the nose is very angular. And actually you can see the divisions of the cartilage plates. Um, so we'll get into that in just a second. Uh, let's go ahead and switch over to my other input here. And, oh yes, I wanted to mention uh, the Black Friday sale uh, for Proco.com. My caricature course is on sale. Stan rarely does sales like this, maybe once or twice a year, uh, where he does a promo 20% off. Uh, up until the end of the day tomorrow, uh, that's the end of the day, November 30th, I believe, uh, that um, if you enter the code BLACK20, if you've never signed up for my caricature course or any of Stan's courses, really, uh, they're all on sale for 20% off. And it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good discount. So if you're thinking about getting it, now's the time to do it because it's not going to go on sale again for a while. Uh, so just be aware of that. Also, uh, my own brushes on Gumroad specifically are on sale uh, until the end of the day uh, tomorrow, Monday the 30th. And that code is um, Black Fry Sale. I think I chose as the code B L A C K F R I S A L E. Sorry, I didn't write it on the uh, thing. Maybe I can write it here. Um, oh, no. Uh, my And my pen registration is off on my tablet here. Um, it's always something. I know. No, everything else is working fine. I just. Oh, now it's working. Okay. It was off for a minute. Uh, but on a Gumroad, let's write it here. Ooh, I can spell Gumroad. Uh, I only have one item for sale, and that's my my digital Photoshop brushes. Uh, twenty percent off, and the code is Black Fry Sale. Uh, all one word, lowercase. Uh, again, that's twenty percent off my brushes, and they're only like ten dollars anyway. But I'll end the sale tomorrow. So just be aware of that if you're thinking about doing that. All right. So as you can see, we got some noses here. Get rid of those. Okay. Uh, various celebrity noses. These are what I'm going to be drawing today and painting. Uh, I also included a sculpture nose, a marble nose, because I mentioned this in the uh, stream on the eyes a couple weeks ago. Sculptures have some of the best forms for studying uh, anatomy. Uh, because they sort of simplified and exaggerated already and idealized so you can actually see the concepts at play uh in in these really really good you know sculptures marble sculptures usually so if you ever see one in a museum take note because they're often well lit too and you can really see the forms highlighted on uh, classical sculptures or sculptures from like the 19th century uh but before we get into the forms the outer structure and painting i'm gonna actually share this I usually don't share other people's uh, anatomical charts, but uh, the nose is a little more, there's a little more going on than with the eye underneath that you don't see that I think is important to know. And I could draw it or I could just save a little bit of time and just show one of my favorite diagrams. And this is from the Stephen Rogers Peck book called, I think, Atlas of Human Anatomy for Artists. Uh, and I, the books, the, the information in the book's pretty good, but the best thing about the book are the illustrations. Uh, they're some of the best, I think. They're very clear. They look very three-dimensional. Everything gives you a really good sense of the forms. Uh, but uh, let's go over real quickly what is going on with the facial anatomy. So the hardest part of the nose is the upper part. It's where it connects with uh, the glabella up at the top. And that is this area. Let me get a pen so I can sort of... 
Oh, let me change this to color mode. So the glabella is the uh, sort of the keystone shaped structure. That's a sort of a downward facing plane just above the root of the nose. The root of the nose is where the glabella connects with the bridge of the nose. And the bridge of the nose uh, is right here. It's the part of the skull, actually, that it's fused to the skull. The two nasal bones sit on the front plane of the upper part of the nose. The side plane of the bony part of the nose is actually made up of the maxilla, the upper uh, portion of the maxilla uh, in between the eyes and the nose. So the side plane of your nose is actually bone as well. But it's at this point that the nose stops being bone and becomes cartilage. So I'm just sort of out outlining the nasal aperture here in red. So if you were to like look at an x-ray, it would sort of look like, uh, like that. But let's get rid of that because it's a little confusing. Uh, so after that, we've got the lateral cartilage, which are two triangular shaped cartilage plates that uh, are joined at the front plane of the nose here and run along the side plane just to above the nostril or wing of the nose. So incidentally, when you see from the front view, the widest part of the bridge of the nose is the part where the nasal bone ends right, uh, right here and the cartilage begins. And also in the side view of the nose, if someone has a bump in their nose from the profile view, that is also usually the place where the nasal bone ends and the cartilage begins. So that's a good landmark to be aware of if you're doing an anatomical study or want to think about what's going on underneath uh, the surface. So we've got that. And then as the nose moves further down to the ball of the nose, the other two main structures or the matching structures are the alar cartilage which form the ball or the tip of the nose, or the apex it's sometimes called. And the top portion is sort of triangular here, the front, place, front facing plane, but then it sort of curves underneath itself and curls in sort of like when you curl your finger, like your knuckles bend uh, at each finger, it actually kind of mim mimics that structure if you want to think of it that way, uh, to go meet with the septum at the middle of the nose at the center line of the face. And uh, it's the same on either side so you'll see that there. Uh, and that's the only main two sets of cartilage plates in the nose. The, uh, the nostril or wing of the nose is formed by a dense fibrous fatty tissue, uh, just the alar fat, and that's the structure we see as the nostril. Now just getting into the Latin a little bit, uh, alar cartilage, uh, ala or ala is Latin for wing. It's one of the words for wing, referring to like an extension or something that uh, moves off to the side. Another word for wing is uh, penna, which you see with like penne shaped muscles, uh, but that more refers to like the feathery structure of a wing. The alar, the ala is the more of the extension itself, the actual appendage of a wing. So anyway, that is where it gets its name because it's near the wing of the nose. And you sometimes hear me refer to the nostrils themselves as the ala or the wings of the nose. So that's where that comes from. It's just derived from the Latin terms for the structures that's, that are going on underneath the surface. Uh, and that's basically it. Um, but if you understand where these cartilage plates are, the planes of the nose make a lot more sense when you're looking at real life uh, examples. So I'll keep sort of keep this visible here. Let me get rid of the uh, my terrible drawing though. Uh, and let's look at some noses. Uh, let's see, we've got some celebrity noses here. Let's make it a little bigger. Uh, on this nose here, you can't actually see any of the separation of the cartilage, and that's okay, uh, but it is sort of there. I'm just going to analyze it really briefly, just kind of draw on top of what is happening uh, with, these, with this nose here. So we've got the nasal bone, which I can't really tell exactly where it ends, but I would guess it ends somewhere around here, the opening of the uh, of the nasal cavity. Uh, then the, uh, sorry, the lateral cartilage runs down the center line. You can actually draw the center line of the nose if it helps. And then I would say the lateral cartilage probably runs along this line here. And then the alar cartilage forms this structure. 
maybe make that a little bigger still even just so in case you guys are watching this on your phones you can see a little better uh so something like that uh here's a nose a side view of the nose that actually makes it a lot more clear uh so you actually can see the nasal bone ending right here and then the lateral cartilage there's actually a good change in plane a change in lighting right there and then the alar cartilage is doing this sort of thing and i do like to whenever i draw cartilage or in and nose anatomy studies i do like to s straighten the lines uh simplify the forms uh, even if it's kind of rounded, just because it helps me visualize the planes of the nose a little bit better. Here's another nose. Uh, the widest point, I would say, is probably about right here. So that's about where the nasal bones end and the cartilage begins. Draw a center line. And you can see a slight, slight change in the planes right about here. If you can see that there. That's where I think the uh, lateral cartilage ends. Then the alar cartilage. I think actually comes around is pretty wide at the base here because I see a change in plane right there. And then curls up underneath itself like that finger, like your uh, knuckles when you curl them. Oops. And there's actually a, a change in plane, which you can actually see here on, this, on the shadow side of the nose. So it's not where the cartilage ends, but it's just where the cartilage that sort of bends around is in shadow. And it also sort of bends around to form the bottom front plane of the nose here. So this is sort of what I'm imagining when I see this nose structure. I'll do one more of this sort of overlay drawing to show you what I mean. Anyone recognize this guy's nose? You might be able to just from that. And actually, that's a good point. When looking at people's features, when you're caricaturing them, if you can tell who the person is just from a photo of that person's feature without seeing the rest of the face, you can sort of see a little bit of the eyes. Um, it goes to show you how important it is to, qual to capture the exact quality of someone's feature. Otherwise, you might miss the likeness overall. And if someone can identify your caricature just by looking at an isolated feature without seeing the rest of the face, you know you've done a really good job. So anyway, we've got the nasal bone here. And I would say it ends right about just where the underneath where the glasses are. <clears throat> and drawing the front plane or the center line of the nose where the cartilage divides. And his cartilage plates are really obvious here. There's the lateral cartilage on either side. You can see because of just the changes in lighting. Then the alar cartilage follows this dark path, this little bit of a shadow or darker half tone here. And you can't really see it curling up underneath because the tip of the nose is facing downward so much. Uh, but we've got the downward facing front plane of the nose, which is sort of in shadow. And then the cartilage itself has some interesting shape to it here. There's a change in plane here, and a change in plane here. Does anyone guess who the... Yeah, Steve Jobs. That's right, Alan. We're just looking at the comments. It's John Lennon, creator of Microsoft. Yeah, it, it does kind of look like John Lennon's nose, actually. I thought about that. But yeah, it is Steve Jobs. Anyway, so that's kind of what's happening. It's, it's you know, some of the cartilage looks a little bit messy. It's not always, like, perfectly structured. Um, actually, I would say this is a little more accurate. Let me cut into that a little bit here. So Steve Jobs' nose cartilage looks a little more like that, I think. Anyway... So let's jump into some studies. And Debbie, if there's any questions that I should be aware of. Not really. Everyone was pretty much transfixed by your technical description of the nose. Fantastic. So let's move that away here. Yeah. 
Just uh, one question about your brushes, but I can save that if you'd like. Um, no, go ahead. I have someone wondering if you were going to make them available to Clip Studio. Um, that's a good question. Uh, can you import Photoshop brushes into Clip Studio? You have to actually go through another, like a third party program because they're different formats, but it can be done. It's a little bit of work. So I guess the question is, will you be doing that work? Um, I had no plans because I don't have Clip Studio Paint to test it to see if that would work or not. Um, is, is, is that the, uh, the version on the iPad or the, uh, or like the PC and Mac? Do they have a version for the iPad? I they definitely have a version for the iPad. I used to have it, uh, I think when they first had it, it was free for about six months. But then it went to a subscription based for, I believe, 10 a month. So I canceled. I don't know if that's still the case, though. Hmm. Uh, the, the only program I've tested it in, and I know it works besides Photoshop, is Procreate. Because um, I have that. Um, some of the brush settings need to be tweaked in Procreate. But, um, but it should work. Um, but hopefully yeah. you're going to do a set where you tweak those brushes, right? And make it available for Procreate, Mr. Jones? Well, um, well, you already can import it into Procreate without, I mean, you just need to like just slide some of the settings like the brush pressure or something or the, the opacity right. or flow. But it's easier when you do it. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys ever do buy my brushes, uh, my brush set, uh, and I ever make any tweaks to that existing set or any improvements, I will send you an email where you can download the updated set for no additional cost. So. Uh, maybe once a year I'll do an update or something, but uh, we'll see. Okay, let's go ahead and start with this nose here. This nose is a little bit more challenging because there's, uh, it's a little more softly lit, uh, but I kind of like that. This is a situation you'll find with uh, most of your portraits and caricatures that you might draw, is a nose that has a little bit of a uh, you know soft lighting problem. But I'll just go ahead and start with the basic forms. I'm just going to outline the nose. trying to come up with that uh, basic shape, just the outline, the envelope that contains the nose, the gift wrapping. If you were to wrap up the nose, like that's what I like to draw first, is just the, uh, the outer, not even contours, just sort of a summary of what's going on with that nose. All right, so then I'm going to divide the front and side and bottom planes from each other. I can barely see the plane on the far side, just a little bit. And it kind of bows out a little, that side plane of the nose. Then the front plane over here, you can see, of course, a lot more of the side divided from the front. Usually the ball of the nose, the apex is, uh, well, the middle portion, the central portion of that nose, the septal area, dips down further than the wings of the nose. So from the profile view, you're almost always going to be able to see inside the nostrils because the wings of the nose are higher than the ball of the nose at its lowest point. Okay, and that's the basics of what's happening with this particular nose here. Now I'm going to outline this just a little bit more carefully, but I do want to get right into painting it so I don't want to spend too much time drawing it. But I'm thinking now, just mentally, maybe I'll draw it, I guess, for this first one, some of the cartilage planes. So I'm going to draw the center line because that kind of helps me visualize the planes. I see the LR cartilage like I did in, like, this is one of the examples I outlined earlier, so I'm pretty aware of what's going on here. Um, comes out a, 
pretty wide. It's a fairly wide ball of the nose with narrower nostrils. And the wing of the nose is actually just a little bit below that, the actual opening of the nostril, below this sort of ridge line that I've drawn. All right. Let me go ahead and start uh, shading this in here. Uh, and I'm going to try to do, I'm going to do these in color here, uh, but I'm going to start with a uh, sort of a warm, neutral, grayish orange color here. I hate painting on a white canvas if I can help it. All right, and I'm going to find the average value of the shadows. There's not much shadow happening on the nose here, just around the side. I guess I will draw some of the shadow underneath the nose. And the shadow is going to be darker than the bottom plane itself. All right, let's find the average value and color in the lights. Yeah, let's get rid of some of these lines. Yeah, let me know if there's any comments or questions that look good no questions but someone did comment that clip paint studio or is it clip studio paint either way they're working on for the next update allowing photoshop brushes to oh, be right. imported but like uh the commenter nathan said who knows how good it'll be so yeah, have to wait and see. Yeah, you know, my experience with Procreate is that yeah, they don't translate over quite perfect. I mean, not perfectly at all. Um, the brush stamps exist in their form that you know when they get imported, but uh, they don't behave the same way just because the hardware is different and the software reads that file information differently, I guess. But they're generally pretty good in Procreate about that.
Okay, I'm gonna start building up some lighter half tones, but keeping in mind the plates of cartilage underneath it and how the ball of the nose is a slightly different plane than the bridge of the nose. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> yeah. um, so right now you're doing a very straightforward, typical portraity nose. Are you going to do a caricature nose after this? If people want me to do one. Did have a request from Kasem. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. I'll. Uh... It's, it's just it's a little tough to caricature the nose out of the context of the whole face because it's one of those things that's um, a nose can look like a portrait nose, even if it's a caricature nose, if you don't have anything else to judge it up against. But I'll try. That's true, because exaggeration is always based on what's around it and how it uh, relates to other features on the face. But are you up for the challenge? Uh-huh. It is a fine looking nose though. Well, thank you. Maybe you should just do, <clears throat> excuse me, nose portraits. Just have people send in pictures of their noses and that it'll be a special gift for their loved ones. Here's my nose. Good idea. <laughs> Why not? I sometimes paint across the forms, like side to side, like on the front plane of the nose here. Uh, and then other times I draw down the long length of the forms. It just kind of depends at what stage I'm at and uh, what I'm doing. But uh, keep in mind that's two ways you can shade the nose, whatever material or method you're using, whatever medium you're working in. Uh, don't always just, you know, render forms and shade them in the same direction. Uh, in a habitual way. You want to uh, mix it up a little bit. You want to create some variety. Because those cross strokes can actually do a lot to help show the three-dimensional forms that you're attempting to convey. So I'm just sort of building up my uh, middle values here, my half tones until I can get to the point where I'm putting the highlights in. Okay, there's a little bit of reflected light on the nostril on the far side here. Very subtle. Just want to make sure that your reflected light does not compete uh, for attention uh, from the, the real lights in the picture, the actual light halftones. So it shouldn't be as bright as anything that's in the halftones. I'm 
Okay, it's getting there. I'm going to lighten up the values just a little bit more here now. And the highlights are also sort of following the uh, structure of the cartilage plates underneath the nose. I'm thinking about that. There is a continuation of light value of sort of highlights running up the nose, but if I can play into my knowledge of the anatomy, that's going to help the nose look even more structurally sound and believable. Even if it's not quite, even if all the information isn't quite there in the photo, I can put it in in my painting because I understand what's going on underneath. Which is the benefit of knowing anatomy is you can change things to improve them when needed to make something more clear or more uh, obvious. Okay, now for the sort of final highlights on this nose. Let me make it a little warmer. Not quite so pink. So I'm thinking about the design of the highlight. I'm looking at my photo, maybe squinting a little bit to see what shapes still remain when my eyes are blurred at it. And I can see that there's sort of two main highlights right here on the ball of the nose and right here on the, uh, the bridge of the nose, but the uh, cartilage portion is sort of where the brightest lights are. All right, so that's about it. I mean, it's just a really quick nose study here. Uh, let's zoom out a little bit. It feels pretty solid. All right, let's do another nose. We got the Steve Jobs nose. We got a girl's nose there. Got an Obama nose. And uh, I can't remember whose nose this is, but that's a pretty good one too. Um, you know what? Oh, you know what? I wanted to show you this other nose, another celebrity nose, because this is a real extreme example of being able to see the nasal cartilage. This is actor Carl Malden, and you can really see the cartilage plates uh, visible in uh, in his nose here. Uh, him and like Owen Wilson is another one where you can actually see the cartilage plates really, really obviously. But uh, of course, you got the nasal bone here. If I'm just doing a quick analysis of Carl Malden's nose, nasal bone, lateral cartilage. And then the alar cartilage with a, with a real clear separation. And a lot of people, you can actually see the uh, the division between the two cartilage plates on the alar cartilage down the middle, especially on the bottom front plane of the nose. So when you see that, that's what's going on. That's why his nose is shaped that way. So it's a real clear example of something like that. Just wanted to share that. But whose nose do you think we should do, Debbie? Obama, I think this is Scarlett Johansson, Steve Jobs. Um, Are you going to caricature or do another portrait? Oh, yeah, I guess we were talking about doing a caricature. Let's do a caricature, I guess. But we'll do a caricature of, like, I guess Scarlett Johansson's nose here. You don't want to do the same one that you just did a portrait of for comparison? No? Mm, no, I think it's more interesting for people to see different noses. I mean, okay. that's just me. All right. So um, I'm going to change the anatomy a little bit to try to imagine what her nose would look like as a caricature. But uh, 
with the same anatomical references of, you know, the cartilage plates that we talked about. So a reminder, this one is a caricature version. Just drawing the planes of the nose first. Okay. So on her nose, the lateral cartilage would come to about here, I think. Here's the lateral cartilage. The end of the nasal bone is up here at the top. Uh, and then the alar cartilage is pretty exaggerated. And I made it a little bit more uh, boxy, I think, and angular than it is in real life. I'll try to keep that when I do the rendering. Okay, let's make that a little bigger as well. So I'll paint underneath the line art here real quickly just to uh, shade some things in real fast, and then I'll paint on top of that layer. Start with a uh, warm gray color. That's maybe a little dark. Okay, let's find the shadow colors. I like the shadows because it helps sort of immediately get to the uh, fundamental structure of the nose here. When you separate the darks and the lights, you're just creating like a two-value drawing. Light and dark. And then we can work on the uh, in-between values after that. And then a bit of a shadow underneath the nose, which will be eventually darker than that. I'm just kind of creating, you know, an average value system here, not totally accurate values. And the average value of the lights here, which is a bit on the dark side, but I kind of like to go a little bit darker rather than lighter at first. It just, I think, works out better that way. Okay. Well, let's erase some of these cartilage lines. Or at least dim them down a little bit. I'll merge these layers. I'm just painting on one layer now. Okay, let's find some of the middle half tones. Any new nose jokes come through? Who knows? <laughs> no, I don't see any. Um, there are some people requesting that they would like to see videos on the fat packets 
of the face since you talk a lot about muscles. That is coming. Ooh, a video on fat. Mm hmm. Nice. Quite a bit down the road, though. I uh, have to be patient. I go over the fat pads a little bit in uh, my um, in the premium version of my Proco caricature course, uh, where it's the lesson on the abstraction, doing the Riley abstraction in caricature, uh, because a lot of the abstraction is actually based on the uh, the typical fat pads on the human face. So uh, I think I have a diagram of them at one point, even though I don't go into a ton of explanation in the video. But uh, uh, so it goes, does go into a little bit in that lesson. But I will have something coming out eventually that's more uh, detailed. Is that going to be on Proco, or are you going to offer... I can't say. Oh. Ooh, it's a secret. I'll never tell. I'll never tell. So, as forms turn away from the light as they go into shadow, they tend to get a little more colorful. Uh, because the, the light, the bright light on someone's face tends to wash out or subdue the color, makes it muted a little bit. Uh, but then as more ambient light takes over uh, on the form, uh, you can actually see the more true, the, the true color of what's happening on the uh, face. Or on any form, really. Also on the nose, the nose tends to be a little uh, more red and pink than other parts of the face because the you know, skin's pretty thin. And uh, it'll often look a little more red. There's more capillaries and blood closer to the surface of the skin on the uh, human nose. And you can play that up. I think it works really well in photos, or I'm sorry, in portraiture or caricature to uh, to have um, a slightly more reddish noses, even if they're not, uh, even if it's not that way in the reference material. I'm going to try that on all my drawings. Yeah, if you notice people like, uh, oh, I think it's like lowish. Uh, who does like typical like girl drawings? And they all have very pinkish noses or nose that have a darker value than the rest of the face, and it's sort of caricaturing that concept when she does that. It can definitely be overdone, but you can make it into a style choice as well, like Loish does. So Matt K is asking: Do core shadows tend to be more colorful? No, the core shadows themselves are actually in shadow, so they're going to be much more muted by comparison. Um, it's just the area, it's the, the dark half tones right before the core shadow, which is sort of this area right here. Well, I'm using a bad color to outline it. Um, but yeah, this the border area right here that I'm outlining in pink, that's going to be the most colorful generally. But it's right before the core shadow, before it goes into shadow. Because when you have shadow on something, you just don't generally see as much color reflecting back it's just there's not enough light not enough visual information to to, to to discern color i have a question on brushes too if you mm -hmm. want to take this one yeah uh, alan's wondering do you always stick to the same brushes or do you adjust and create new brushes from your previous ones yeah yeah uh, and i borrow other people's brushes i've used other people's brushes for years that i liked I have a few, you know, based off the default Photoshop brushes even that I like, you know, just just with a few tweaks. You know, for years I just would paint with the basic round brush because I didn't know about custom brushes at a certain point early on, you know. And I, you could actually do these digital paintings as long as you know how to handle the stylus and stuff and have good settings. But, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm switching it up, but generally the past year or so I've been using my brushes almost exclusively because I just because I've been developing them and working on them and I wanted to test them uh, in as, on as many paintings as possible to make sure they work for people. And that's why it took me so long to get them released. <laughs> I didn't want to have uh, brushes that were not totally, you know, beta tested by me. Just so you guys know, we're probably going to end the stream a little earlier than usual today, you know, about uh, 
seven or eight minutes. So I'm going to finish this up and it'll be my last uh, demo here. So think about your any other questions you might have. Kasem is asking, is color dodge suitable for lighting? You can use it a little bit, but if I ever do a color dodge or burn uh, to tweak something, I just use it a few strokes and then stop because it can get quickly over. It just gets a burned in look or a washed out look too quickly. In case you guys don't know, it's it's a, an old tool that's been built into Photoshop for years where you can slightly lower, you know, increase the value or Dark, darken the value or lighten the value of an existing of the existing pixels, kind of like you're exposing it to more light in the dark room. Uh, if you've ever taken like traditional photography and done film processing and development or printing from your own negatives, uh, you would do dodging and burning with actually you would dodge by holding a little cardboard or some kind of thing to block the light from the enlarger from the projector uh, over the photographic print as it's being exposed. Um, or there's might be an area where you mask off other areas if you want to overexpose a certain area so you'd burn in an area. But yeah, it, uh, it can create higher contrast effects, but it can get out of control. Uh, it can be, you know, it oversaturates the colors and stuff. So just be careful with stuff like that. You definitely can use it, but uh, with caution. Okay, let's get these little highlights here on the nose. And I only see true highlights here on the apex of the nose, and then again a little bit at the uh, up by the nasal bone at the top. Everything else is just basically a light half tone and not a true highlight. Uh, if you get photo reference to work from to do feature studies like this, you may find yourself needing to tweak the values a little bit, and which is what I did on all of these photos. I, I tried to, uh, I adjusted the values on my photo reference of these noses uh, just, just to get a little bit better contrast if there wasn't enough, or maybe decrease the contrast if there was too much. But if I liked the picture of the nose and the, and the values weren't quite right, I you know manipulated a little bit till it looked uh, friendly to paint. So don't think you have to deal with and you know live with the exact photos that you get that you find uh, online or if you take photos of subjects uh, you always feel free to manipulate their values uh, lightening them and docking them messing with the contrast until they uh, until they'll work for you because the camera doesn't automatically capture what is best for an artist it's up to you to to do that to figure that out and if you need to change the photo reference to do it a good skill to have to be able to manipulate photos properly. There's no secret or trick to what to do or no formula. It's just whatever looks good, you know. If you want to paint something high contrast, manipulate the photo to be more high contrast or vice versa. So do have one more question that came in mm -hmm. from Lone Walker. He says, I can draw anything, but I cannot draw a correct eye. I exercise a lot, but I cannot do it from a live, for a live portrait. Mm -hmm. I know you did eyes last week. Yeah, if you right? haven't seen my my eye example, my, my video from two weeks ago, my live stream, feel free to check that out because I do go cover the anatomy and a procedure for sculpting. Uh, the key to good eye studies, I think, when you're, learning anatomy of a feature and trying to just practice the form get real high contrast strong shadows strong highlights um 
and usually it's you, it's almost impossible to find that just with normal Google photo searches. You, ha you usually have to take pictures of yourself or a model under perfect under good lighting, get a good strong light source, light it kind of a three quarter lighting view from the from an angle from above, and uh, kind of like these uh, the photos of the sculptures here that I showed earlier. These are re really good examples of lighting on noses. But try to do the same for eyes. Uh, and light specifically for the eye. Don't light, if you're taking pictures of the face just for photo reference, if you want to get good eye reference material, uh, light, look at the person's eye that you're drawing, that you're photographing and light it for that. Don't light a good nose, light a good eye, if you know what I mean, if, if that's the particular feature you're after for that photo session that you're doing. Okay, just about finished here. You know, it's very impressionistic and loose. And of course, it again, it's a caricature version of Scar Scarlett Johansson's nose, not a realistic version. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's very soft, softly lit. There's not a lot of strong lighting on it. So it's not the best to do a study like this from. Um, but this is what you will encounter uh, in the real world if you're trying to paint and draw celebrity photos. Most of these photos are taken under less than ideal circumstances for an artist. Okay, we're about at that time. Debbie, any other Yeah, cool you want to squeeze in one more? Yeah, Can we okay. squeeze in one more? Yeah. All right. Uh, I think this has come up before, but Great Touch uh, wants to know if you would talk more about blending colors. I know that you use the Alt key a lot and sample colors next to where you're blending. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, um, when I paint, I mean, it's a lot of it is just mechanically, physically, my hand, my left hand, the paint, the one that's not painting, is actually on the keyboard express key, the keyboard key or the express key on my tablet. And I'm using the eyedropper tool constantly. You can see, you know, this paintbrush here, you see how it's turning into an eyedropper tool? I am doing that constantly. So once I get a few colors from my color picker window here, I don't go back to it very often after a while. Once I've got a, a nice selection of colors on the face or whatever subject it is I'm painting, um, I just constantly sample from the dark and I paint some dark and I'll sample from the intermediate color and paint that intermediate color. Because say you got this, you know, dark shadow here and this nice half tone here. Well, what you can do is once you have a sort of a um, intermediary tone here in the middle from where you overlap those colors, then you can sample that intermediary color. And now you're painting with that intermediate color. Well, now it is a little dim. There's not a lot of color into it. So I might need to go back to my color picker window and just make use that same value, but just slide it over to the right a little bit and make it more chromatic, but try to keep it at the same value. And so I'm constantly selecting back and forth. And now I've shaded and blended this little shape. And now it looks sort of like a cylinder. Sorry, it's kind of small, but... Um, and that's that's it. That's that's what blending is. It's just using intermediary colors in between your two main colors. Like if you think of it like a mosaic, you have a mosaic of one color, a mosaic tile of one color, a mosaic tile of another, and you want a third mosaic tile, so you got to get that somehow. So well, I'll paint from that. I'll paint my dark into it, then I'll paint my light into it, and now I've got a third color. And if you do that enough times, and keep in mind the color saturation, you know how it how it actually. You lose the saturation when you do that. You just need to go back to here every now and then to, to get it a little bit more reddish. If it's like, say, a skin tone, for example, and then sample, 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 sample. I mean, I'm doing it that much. It's constant. So I don't know if you can even hear in the microphone. That's me pressing the button. <laughs> so, yeah, just a lot of color sampling. And it's not necessarily about the brush you use. It's just about uh, how you're working with the colors and the values. And the choices you're making keep the strokes short don't use the same color too much over and over again in your uh, painting process just constantly sample once you've got enough colors on the canvas you can start sampling from everywhere around the canvas all right so i think that is about it um thanks you guys so much for joining me i hope you learned something today it's always fun to go over this kind of stuff because i like the anatomy of the face i like knowing the terms and i like understanding the structures because um, I can look at someone's artwork and tell if they don't know the underlying structure of the feature. It's really obvious once you have that knowledge, then you can like point it out and be critical. And I like being critical. You should probably mention for people who joined late about the uh, Proco 
Black Friday sale and the oh yeah, so sale again. Yeah, if you missed the beginning of the stream, um, tomorrow is the last day of the Proco uh, caricature course sale, or all the courses are actually on sale. Uh, if you use the uh, promo code uh, Black Twenty on the Proco website, my caricature course is on sale. All of other stands anatomy courses and uh, drawing courses are on sale until the end of the day on uh, November 30th, which is tomorrow. And the sale like this doesn't happen very often. So hopefully you can check that out if you haven't gotten any of those courses. It'll really help, I think. Anyway, thanks again, everybody. I will see you next week. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving time if you celebrate Thanksgiving. Um, and I will see you soon. Say bye, Debbie. Bye, Debbie.